That was an amazing campaign. We're going to play Kevin's Infinity Game next, right? Yeah, that's right. It uh, should last about 20 or 30 sessions. Um, all of you should create characters, and then we'll meet back here next week. Uh-oh. You've already made your first mistake. If you're getting ready to launch a dedicated campaign, it means that you and your players are probably committing to 20 or 30 weekly or bi-weekly sessions. You're going to be playing these characters for the next six months, a year, maybe two years, maybe more. That's a major commitment, so you're going to want to make sure that you get things off on the right foot. Everything else you do in the campaign will be built on the foundation of that first session. And even before that first session begins, you have character creation. So the last thing you want to do is tell your players, hey, uh, go create a bunch of random characters, then bring them on in and hopefully it will all work out. You need a session zero. A session that's dedicated to just laying the foundation for everything that comes after it. Now, there's a lot of other stuff you might do during a session zero, but for today, we're going to focus on character creation. The first and most important thing to understand is that character creation is not a solo affair. It is a collaborative process. At a minimum, it's a collaboration between you and the player. Ideally, in my experience, it's the entire group collaborating together. In fact, rather than thinking of it as character creation, it's probably more useful to think of it as group creation. Some games, like Tech Noir or The Dresden Files, are already designed to do character creation as a group, with specific procedures that will require the players to work together. But even in games like D&D or Infinity, which don't have these explicit procedures, you'll still find this collaborative approach pays big dividends. Now, once everyone is gathered for the Session Zero, the first thing you'll want to do is establish the campaign premise. Who are the characters, what do they do, and where do they do it? For example, uh, the PCs are street samurai who take mercenary jobs from corporate agents in Night City. Or they're the crew of an interstellar tramp freighter in the Human Concordat. Or they're koala bears seeking a cure for chlamydia in the Australian Outback. As the GM, you might have a specific premise in mind, which was probably included in your campaign pitch. In some cases, just picking the game you're going to play provides the entire premise. For example, if you say, do you all want to play Blades in the Dark? Then I know that we'll be playing a game about a group of daring scoundrels building a criminal enterprise in the haunted streets of the industrial fantasy city of Duskfall, because that's literally the first sentence in the rulebook. But if I tell you that we're going to be playing GURPS, the universal role-playing game, then I've told you literally nothing about the campaign premise, and I'll need to fill in a few details before we get started. Between these two extremes, you'll find games like D&D, which have some baked-in assumptions about the campaign premise, like all of the PCs being wandering heroes seeking treasure, but which will still require you to fill in the other blank spots. And of course, you can often reject these default premises and do something completely different. Maybe this is a D&D &D campaign where all of the PCs are arena gladiators, or librarians in Candlekeep, or pirates in the Southern Sea. The creation of your campaign premise can itself be a collaborative process. The question, what do you all want to play next, is basically the most simplistic form of that. But in addition to answering the three basic questions of who, what, and where, you can also create a discussion about the specific themes and even events that the players would like to explore in the campaign. If you want to see what this can look like in actual practice, uh, check out the Dresden Files RPG that I mentioned earlier, or Luke Crane's Burning Empires, both of which formalize this collaborative process in really interesting ways. Now, whatever the campaign premise may be, you'll probably want to flesh it out a bit with specific information. For example, I recommend prepping a brief setting handout that will orient the players and give them the essential context they need to start imagining their characters. In fact, emailing this to your players ahead of time is probably ideal. One or two pages is usually enough, and in my experience, five pages is the absolute maximum. Anything longer than that, and some or all of the players just won't read it, which obviously defeats the purpose. Make sure that this handout includes any information that is required for character creation. In D&D, for example, that includes the gods, because clerics need to pick their deity, and languages, because everyone needs to pick those. With everyone on the same page now, uh, pun intended, we can now move on to step two, which is creating the character concepts. Now, I generally just cut the players loose at this point and let them create whatever their fervid imaginations conjure up. Importantly, however, they're all doing this at the same table, which allows them to continue collaborating with each other. If you've played D&D or World of Warcraft, you've probably already done this in a truncated form. Uh, hey, who's playing the healer? Do we have a tank? But it's really powerful to push this same collaboration into the character concepts themselves. Hey, hey, what if my character was your sister? Or we're both playing wizards. Could we, could we have both been apprenticed to the same master? 
And again, there are RPGs that specifically are designed to foster these connections. A tip that can be used in almost any game, though, is to simply ask the players to make sure that their character has an existing relationship with at least one other PC. I'll actually be sharing a cap system that you can use to take this technique to the next level in a future video, so make sure to hit the subscribe button now and make sure you don't miss that. As you can see, this process usually goes hand in hand with whatever the mechanical procedure is for creating characters in your role-playing game of choice. At some point, though, what you'll have from each player is a basic concept. This might be a couple sentences, it might be a few paragraphs, or it, it might be multiple pages of detailed background. It, it really depends on the player, how inspired they are, and what type of campaign it is. My philosophy is that whatever the player wants to give me is good, whether that's a sentence or a novella. What happens next is what I call public integration. Basically, I'm going to take my expertise in the setting and use it to turn generic archetypes of the character concept into specific content. Uh, for example, uh, the player might tell me that they want to play a barbarian who grew up in a frozen wasteland. And I'd say, uh, great, you could be a member of the tribe of the Red Elk, uh, which is a barbarian clan who lives in the northern wastes. And I'd give them some details about the tribe, and I'd ask, does that sound like what you're looking for? Now, in some cases, this will be me pulling relevant information from my notes or source books. And in other cases, I'm using the character creation process as a prompt to create new details about the setting for myself. Now, there are a couple reasons I do this. First, I find that the collaboration tends to encourage more deeply imagined characters. And second, my players rarely know as much about the campaign setting as I do, even if it's a published campaign setting. And so the collaboration is both a way of taking advantage of the setting to create a more interesting character, and also a way of more deeply immersing the player into the setting. Now, this doesn't have to be super elaborate. I want to play a priest of the god of war. The God of War is uh, it's a tour, and that might be all you need or want to do. Of course, you can do more than that, too. You can add details about how the Church of a tour operates, uh, what the history of the church is, what the religious uniforms of the church are, what the holy symbol of the god is, and so on and so on. You might also tell the player that you don't have a God of War yet, or if you do have one, that you haven't created a lot of details about a tour, and then invite the player to create those details. Although this process will almost always start at the table, I often find it useful to finish it via email. At the end of session zero, I'll ask the players to email me their character backgrounds, which will give them a chance to finish developing exactly what they want, and then I'll reply with additional information as appropriate. It's important to remember throughout this process that your goal isn't to overwrite what the player wants. It's exactly the opposite. Your goal is to help them develop and enrich their original character concept, not, not change it. If they say they want to play a knight, and I offer them three different orders of knighthood their character could belong to, my goal is to find the one that's right for them. And if I can't offer them a choice, then I'll emphasize that by saying, does that sound right? And if we don't have the right one, then we'll create it. Now, at the end of this process, both you and the player will have a detailed background for the character that's been fully integrated into the campaign world. And at the same time that you're wrapping up this public integration, you'll also want to start your third phase of character creation, which is private integration. As the GM, you want to start figuring out how to hook the character into the larger structure of the campaign. Is there a major villain in the second act? Make it the long-lost brother of one of the PCs. Is there a kidnapped victim in the third adventure? Make it a PC's mentor. Were you planning to have a corrupt order of wizards? Give one of the PCs a chance to join it, and so forth. You're figuring out how to make the campaign about the characters, instead of just involving the characters. And this obviously works in the opposite direction, too. Take inspiration from the player's character backgrounds to weave new threads into your campaign. Is the campaign about a civil war to determine the king's heir, and one of the PCs chose to join an order of knighthood? Well, well then you'll probably want to figure out how the order fits into the political tapestry of the kingdom. Uh, check out our previous videos on better scenario hooks and the campaign stitch for a more in-depth look at what this kind of campaign planning looks like. I'll drop links to those down below in the, uh, the font of all knowledge. Now, now, last but not least, you want to bring the party together. And more so than anything else we've discussed, this isn't really a separate step, but rather something that should be taken into consideration throughout, throughout the entire character creation process. What binds these separate characters together? At least 95 times out of 100, you'll want to explain why the PCs are all going to generally hang out and do things together before you start the first session. And four out of the remaining five times, you'll probably want to have things prearranged so that they fall in together within the first couple scenes.
A really key thing to understand here is that it's not your sole responsibility as the GM to make this happen. The players should be collaborating with each other to figure it out. You can definitely help them out, though. Uh, establishing long-term relationships and common goals are good places to start. It's also useful to point them at the premise. You're all occult investigators interested in supernatural mysteries. Well, how did you all end up doing that? When did you first start doing it together? Having all of the PCs belong to a specific organization often provides an easy answer to all of these questions. This might be a larger organization, like a government agency or a religious order, which has assigned the PCs to work together. Or it might be a smaller organization that the PCs have founded for themselves. Another approach is to point them at the first scene or initial hook of the campaign. When I was running the Eternal Lies campaign for Trail of Cthulhu, for example, I told the players that the campaign would begin with all of them being hired by a millionaire to investigate some weird occult stuff. They could have pre-existing relationships with each other if they wanted, but the key thing was that they each needed to create a character that it would make sense for the millionaire to want to hire. Similarly, when I was running the Dragon Heist campaign for D&D, I told the players that in the first scene, all of their characters would be walking through the door of the Yawning Portal Tavern in Waterdeep together, where they would be meeting someone who was going to hire them to do a job. As they created their characters, all they needed to do was explain how they got to that point together. Now, if you'd like to see detailed step-by-step examples of this procedure put into actual practice, I'll be dropping some links to that in the font of all knowledge. There's also a link to So You Want to Be a Game Master down there, which is my new book. For even more information on booting up your new campaign, you should grab a copy today. If you'd like to join our party here at the Alexandrian, sign up by hitting the subscribe button while you're down there and introduce yourself in the comments. We'll be leaving on another adventure very soon. Good gaming. I'm Justin Alexander, and I'll see you at the table.